So, good evening everyone. Uh, welcome again for those who were here at the six o'clock screening and welcome to all the ones who have joined us for this uh, full uh, cinema room tonight. I'm very, very happy that so many of you came. Uh, this is really a special program and a very special um, start on our summer semester of the lecture and film series dedicated to the work of Chantal Ackermann. Um, we uh, are starting, uh, like I said, second part. We already had the whole uh, winter semester uh, with lots of very interesting talks. And um, many of you have been here already. For those who have missed one or the other lecture so far, you can check all of them on YouTube, on our YouTube channel of the Film Museum. And um, of course, please join us for the second part of the series. You can find all the information on this leaflet that is outside and also in our website. Um, we also have lots of series of, of films screening around this main program. So you have like accompanying programs, our big light program. So do check that as well. We have lots of other interesting films. For example, I would like to um, point out, of course, tonight is a very special screening because we have Babette Mongold with us. So um, I'm very happy that we already got to talk about her films a little bit. And now she's going to tell us more about Chantal Ackerman's work and her work with her before we watch um, Un jour Pina a demandé. Um, when they Pina asked documentary they did about Pina Bausch and um, we are also going to screen a film did done by uh, Pina Bausch herself uh, that film Die Klage der Kaiserin is going to be screened here in the cinema tomorrow at 6 p.m. and a very nice 35 millimeter copy so if you happen to be in Frankfurt tomorrow don't miss it at 6 p.m. here and on Tuesday also at 6 p.m. we are screening uh, another of Babette Mongold's film The Camera Je La Camera I and that's going to be a, a very, very nice um, screening. We're going to have a little, I'll, I'll give a little introduction to the film and I'm very look, looking forward to that as well. So also keep those um, uh, dates and times in head and all the program that is about to follow, which we're very excited about. I just would like to thank again um, our partners in this program here, my team of the Film Museum, but of course the Institute for Theater, Film and Media of the Goethe University here in Frankfurt, Professor Vinton Schrediger, with whom we have been working on this lecture and film series, and uh, of course the support of the Excellence Cluster and Normative Orders, the City of Frankfurt and the Hessische Film and Media Academy, and the um, the city of Frankfurt, have I already mentioned? No. Um, right, so uh, I would like to invite Professor Vincent Schrediger, who will now give a brief introduction to Babette Mangold um, before the lecture. Thank you very much. Yeah, brief indeed. A good evening from my side. It's always good to be speaking to a full house. Um, as you have noticed, if you follow the first half of the series, uh, it has been our um, aim to bring uh, together in our roster of uh, speakers the major theorists and critics working on the uh, films of Chantal Ackermann together with collaborators, uh, friends, people who have been involved in, in uh, making uh, the films and tonight's guest uh, is one of those but it is a very special privilege to be able to welcome Babette Mongold here in Frankfurt because Babette Mongold is of course uh, an important friend and collaborator of Chantal Ackermann but she's obviously also as all of those who uh, just saw the screenings of her own films at six o'clock will uh, know if they weren't already aware of it. She's also a major artist uh, in her own right, a major figure of the film avant-garde of the last 50 years, um, a photographer, a writer, a theorist, um, and a scholar. Uh, Babette Mongold, I said it before, I uh, just want to uh, mention it again, is a mathematician by training, uh, then went to film school, the National uh, Film School uh, the Ecole uh, Louis Lumière in Paris, uh, trained as a cinematographer, uh, worked as a cinematographer and editor in France uh, in the late 60s, decided to leave France because <clears throat> she did get quite a few jobs, but they never lasted for more than two days because even though her work was technically perfect, she made the all-male crews uncomfortable and didn't get any permanent job, so she decided to move to the United States. And uh, there she became part of one of the most interesting um, and productive and challenging art scenes uh, that the 
history of art has ever seen. Uh, I don't think that's hyperbole. Um, if you uh, go through the list of the people she's worked with, from Yvonne Rayner <coughs> uh, to Chantal Ackermann and many, many others, uh, you will see that uh, this has really been a key moment in in uh, the, 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 the history of art of the 20th century. And she sort of landed right in the middle of it. And uh, what I find interesting about it, this is something we talked about today at length, is that her facilitator, the go-between, was actually a film theorist and a film scholar and a critic, um, namely Annette Michelson, who was one of the founding figures of our own field, uh, one of the first professors of cinema in an American university who taught at uh, NYU from the late 60s until uh, her almost her death uh, just a few years ago. And Annette told me how, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Babette told me how Annette Michelson introduced her basically to uh, all of the figures, Jonas Mikas, uh, uh, Yvonne Rayner, that became uh, important and influential uh, in her own work, but also became uh, partners in in uh, what she was doing and collaborators, uh, and she became an important collaborator for them. So, all I have to do is thank Babette for accepting the invitation, uh, for making this a very very special evening, by gracing our series with her presence, and by allowing us uh, allowing us to kick off the second half of this season or the second half of the series with an appropriate opening. Uh, Babette will now give an introduction to Chantal's film. Without further ado, please take over. Thank you, Lola and Vincent for their invitation. And I want to thank you to be here, yeah. So I met Chantal, who was uh, uh, born in 1950 when I met her in uh, early October 71, she was 21. She had already made a film, as you know, Sort Ma Ville, another film shot with a man camera, uh, a cameraman, which had been a total failure and was never finished. And she was looking for New York as a way maybe to find a solution for where to go next. So she had met in uh, Jerusalem at the film festival in, uh, in uh, late, uh, I think the festival in Jerusalem where she had family and she went every year, was um, uh, in July at that time, at the end of July. So she met somebody who was among the participants of the jury named Marcel Hanoun. And Marcel Hanoun is... Uh, filmmaker of uh, importance in France, who started in 59, greatly admired by Godard, who made uh, eccentric film and uh, semi-experimental uh, film. And for me, he trained me as a camera person because he was the only person when I was still in France who gave me the possibility to be AC when he was director of his film, but also cinematographer of his film. But he was not good at lighting, and I was very good at lighting. So it was a match made in heaven, basically. So Marcel said to Chantal, uh, who wanted to go to New York, uh, Chantal asked, do you know anybody in New York? So Marcel gave him my phone number because he knew that. We had met in, in we had seen each other in New York when he was there the year before. And I was living there, and I was in contact with him because I had shot a movie for him in uh, in uh, August. Uh, just uh, I was going to shoot a movie in August uh, with him, so just after the festival. So um, I knew I was going back to New York too. So in any case, I met Chantal, and although there was a difference in age, we immediately bonded because we had something in common. We had been somehow... Uh, uh, you know, disappointed in the fact that in the film industry, which was totally dominated by men, uh, women were not seen as partner, basically. They could be actress because you could fuck them, you know, this kind of thing. Uh, in a way, it's very exploitative, and it still is, and it's even worse now, I think, than it was, I think, in the 60s, by the way. So the things is not better. 
although it's changing now rapidly in the US uh, uh, because of the Me Too movement and because uh, streaming and Netflix uh, have a lot of uh, filmmakers and producers who are women now. So the situation is really changing in the US, bizarrely. I don't know if it's changing in, in Europe as much. But um, we bonded and feminism became or the, the desire to invent a new language uh, which was the language of uh, of women and did not quote things which we had learned from, uh, which we were copying from uh, already made form, if you want. So we were interested in doing experimental work, which were different from what was done before. It's the definition of experimental work. So that created the first film that Chantal did in New York and I shot, and we became friends because of it. Also, Sir Jan Dillman, which was their first major success, commercial success to a certain degree, and certainly uh, aesthetic success. But I was living in New York, and she was living in Paris. I did not want to live in New York, in Paris, for sure. So we saw each other when we were in the same city, basically, but we kept track of each other all through these years. And I was seeing a film, uh, maybe sometime late, but I was always seeing a film and I was showing her my film and so on. So we share things in common all through our life. And uh, after she died, I uh, decided to write uh, a, a text uh, about uh, a relation to music and I thought it was important because the last film I shot for her and it was accidental, it just happened I was in New York then and I was very interested in Pina Bausch which I knew about but I had never seen but the the performance world and the, 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 the dance world is a world I knew very very well by then I had done already very, a very important dance film, Water Murder uh, a solo of Trisha Brown and I knew how to photograph dance and so on. So I felt that was interesting for me to be uh, the camera person of that film. And uh, Chantal had seen Bandoleon, uh, I think it's called, I forgot, I put the name somewhere in my, in my text, which is uh, 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 something I had never seen, which Pina Bosch had done in 1980 with uh, music of a tango song by uh, Carlos Gardel, uh, basically the most famous tango uh, writer in the world and totally uh, uh, known of people like me in New York who function in the avant-garde of new music and so on and so on. And I'm sure uh, 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 Chantal who was uh, really very interested in music. Uh, definitely had, 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 had a relationship with that piece. But um, when she signed the contract, she was still not quite sure then she could do it. But I say, you know, you will see it's not so complicated. and. Uh, uh, and uh, the film was really, I think, important for her, but it was also very uh, uh, disappointing. When you see the film, you know why, and I'm not going to discuss that. But after Chantal's death, uh, I decided to reflect on the difference between the film she did in the 70s the last one being Les Rendez-vous d'Anna, and the film she did in the 80s, the first one being Toute une nuit. And Toute une nuit is a film she showed me the script in 1981, and I thought the script was extraordinary. And I'm going to start my reflection on the film of Chantal Akaman in the 1980 with a description of Toute une nuit, a description of uh, the film you are going to see later, Un jour Pina a demandé, uh, uh, that documentary on Pina Bausch. Uh, who, wa who was with their company on a tour going to uh, Venice, to Milan, and finishing in Avignon, where she was going to premiere at the Theatre Film Festival Nelken, a very important piece uh, of Pina Bausch. But she started with Café Muller. Uh, we did not add it in the tour, but we saw it... Uh, uh, with a fragment of it, uh, she uh, she started with uh, uh, with um, uh, 
you know, she she was undergoing a transformation because I think in 1980 her husband died and she changed a set designer. So 1983, which is Nelken, was very different from what she had done in the early 70s. And the film can chronicle that to the degree. If you are, uh, uh, you know, if you know the work of Pina Bausch, for me, the work of these first 10 years of her life is by far the most interesting. She reworked a lot of the piece she did originally in different contexts later on, but I don't particularly like her later work, although I'm very sorry she died so young because, you know, it was still, uh, it was still very shocking. She died so quickly, yeah. So anyway, I'm going to read my text and make the best. Uh, I hope that that will be interesting to you. Uh, so... I come and film Tout une nuit. Tout une nuit in English, it's like uh, everything happened in one night. You know, it's, it's, it's an episodic film. Introduce unexpressed emotion and romantic longing that were not present in their film from the 70s, where the inability to express love and desire was not foregrounded. The film was shot in 1981 was uh, written in 1981. No, it was shot in 1981 and released in 1982. And it's all about couple in love or separating with song coming from juice box in bar that are tuned for people to dance with when they meet in bars. Music was not essential to the emotional impact of the film that rely more on gesture in the ordinariness of the street, entrance of building, cafe, bar. But that changed in our next film, and music became an anchor in all like Herman film and until Almayer's Folly. I think music is not as important in our last film, which is, as probably you know, it's no home movie. So, but I think in as Almayer's Folly, have you shown it, or are you going to show it? Yeah. It was the opening film. Oh, yeah, because I think it's an amazing film in relation with music, yeah. And also, it's very interesting, it's an homage to the father. Uh, so it's personally important for Chantal to finish her most important, one of her most important last film uh, with a father figure. A common interest in music and theatricality was tested by a commission documentary shot in the summer 1983 for Antenne 2. One of the six TV channels in France then, on Pina Bausch Reportal Dance Theatre, Shot on tour in Milan and Venice with work that showcased Pina Bausch attraction to ballroom dancing, form with popular song from the 1930 and movement that highlights sexual tension and couple formation. A little bit what Chantal had done uh, very differently in terms of uh, sensibility, uh, because it's not at all the same music and so on in uh, Toute une nuit, and it has nothing to do with the kind of... Uh, 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 sensibility of Pina Bausch, which is much more acerbic uh, than Chantal, which is very soft. So, uh, the film was shot over a period of six weeks, and we had done a week of uh, scouting the location. I mean, we had scout uh, Essen and the Wuppertal Dance Studio where they were working and had uh, been exposed to some of the uh, dance vocabulary of the group and spoken to the group. So for me, that was important to know, uh, to know how to shoot and which equipment to get. Uh, so the conclusion of the film was imposed and could be shot only uh, when it was staged for the first time in Avignon. But I knew Avignon very well, so for me that was also reassuring. Uh, Chantal interviewed during the release of her film, the film uh, done about Pina Bash, mentioned that she has seen Bandoneon from 1980. And that's what actually had given her a sense of what Pina Bausch was. For me, I knew just her reputation. I knew nothing about her work, but I knew she had come to New York. I'd worked with Paul Taylor. I knew Paul Taylor in terms of choreography. I was not particularly interested. It's commercial choreography for me. You know, it has nothing to do with the Judson. But definitely, the fact it was theater more than choreography was known to me. And that's what you're going to see in the film. So, filming Un jour Pina demandé, Ackerman got fascinated by how Pina Bausch worked with her performer and how personal story of member of her company, solicited by Pina, 
were integrated in Bosch spectacle during improvisation with the company. So improvisation was definitely something Pina had got from New York. For me, I am absolutely sure of that. And uh, that became one of the one of the team of uh, of the film of Chantal, who analyze on on in the course of filming, if you want, what was happening in uh, in uh, as the foundation of how Pina was working with the people in her company, a performer, let's say, uh, a dancer performer. The film was his long take of, uh, here I'm speaking of the film of, of uh, Chantal Ackerman, the film was his long take of repeated gesture that are either the same for men and women, organizing war on the contrary, amplifying the contrast between men and women behavior, is revealing of Pina Bausch emotional interest. The film starts with some of the most memorable moments of men and women touching their face, their lips, their bodies, self-involved and all close to each other and then moving in unison in a circle before separating to form couple fighting or making out in Bausch piece, 1980. We shot that in Essen in a rehearsal studio, so there is not the scenery, but it was really, it's a dynamic beginning. The motif of couple caressing or fighting each other is recurrent in every Pina Bausch work in the film, as Pina demanded, although there could have been other things which were decided to be shot, but that's what Chantal basically uh, decided to do. Other work using gesture clearly amplified the victimization and fighting spirit of one woman in a man's world, like in Come Dance With Me from 77, one scene which was the earlier piece we saw, uh, one scene where the woman is passive is particularly painful to watch in Contact Off from 78, performed at the Scala in Milano in July 1982, in June 1983. We shot June and uh, to the third week of July. So we're three weeks in June, three weeks in July. Um, uh, where do I am? Uh, so the, the, the 10 men, all in formal attire and dressed in black, keep on touching the only woman in a flesh color evening dress. And the men literally prevent the woman to move away by surrounding her and repeatedly touching her nose, mouth, throat, breast, fondling her under her dress. You see only the upper part of the man's body and face. And when the woman slides down as in a fainting spell, the camera follow her face falling with all the man's hands still on her, propping her to get back up and keeping on fondling her incessantly. A new song starts and the woman does not appear to react to those hands everywhere on her. This scene is really unbearable because the violence imposed on the woman's body is so vividly relentless and the two songs do not reflect the stylization of a gang rape that the movement implies. So uh, the fact that the sound and the picture are not saying the same thing is typical of Chantal's film actually. Although it's not in every, in all their use of music, later on I'm going to uh, show that's not the case in other film. This scene is really unbearable because the violence, oh yeah. After some three minutes, the man leaves her there, barely breathing, standing up, the camera pan to the right with the man all joyous turning in a circle, waiting for dance partner. A new woman enter in their circle while we have lost sight of what happened to the victim. The film opens Okay, that I, I don't remember. Apparently we start in Avignon, but... Uh, <laughs> so I'm describing... That's irrelevant with the music, so I should stop speaking of it. Sorry. Okay, the use of music in Pina Bausch work is often a popular song connected with the 30s and obviously song, German song in the 30s have some implication of being uh, reminding uh, German people uh, and even me, French, you know, of uh, the Nazi uh, uh, in power uh, in the 30s. And that was the case, of, uh, the case of Contact Off, that was the case of Café Muller, that was the case of several of her, of her early pieces. So although there was no political message in the film, the music was bringing a connotation which was 
in uh, in in accordance if you want with the miss the abuse that men uh, uh, made of women in a fascist uh, society where they are treated just as uh, you know uh, mother to be and nothing else uh, so I think for me that reading was really important and Chantal definitely picked up on it. So I think it's a little bit in the film. Uh, now, uh, in the in a piece that we both admire a lot and which was extremely popular for Pina Bausch and which is the 1980, which was done in 1980, which was set up in a park and uh, the music was uh, the reference of the music was uh, english music american music i mean uh, uh, and uh, and all music also uh, you know uh, some tune from uh, ireland in gaelic or things like that so uh, the reference was not always in all the pieces we had seen with german music connected with the nazi era but there were several which were so i thought that was also interesting and it's not outlined in the film that Chantal made, but she definitely could decode those things. Uh, Chantal had a perfect pitch and a perfect hear. And what happened in night after the end of the film uh, and the end of the editing of the Pina Bar, she had to remit the film edited, uh, you know, uh, I think by November or something like that, to the television station which paid for it and we had finished the shoot in July, so it took two months to edit, something like, or three months to edit. I'm not sure because I was back in the US doing uh, another work, but uh, uh, she became sick and uh, uh, she stopped working for uh, about a year and a half. But uh, her recovery, uh, was helped by the meeting of somebody named Som Sonia Vider Atherton, uh, which, by the way, is the sister of Claire Atherton, which was the editor of uh, Chantal and came here, I think, to talk already, uh, and was written beautiful text uh, about her work with Chantal and uh, Chantal methodology, actually, uh, recently published too. Uh, so the the before shooting the Pina Bausch film, Chantal had started to shoot in the winter a film called also Les années 80, nothing to do with Pina Bausch, which used 1980 as the title of a film, so it's not related. Uh, but uh, Chantal wanted to do a musical comedy and wanted to write songs, so she got a music, and very much in the tradition of Michel Legrand, the musician who did the music of Les Parapluies de Cherbourg, uh, Jacques Demy, uh, uh, Umbrella of Cherbourg, and uh, uh, Demoiselle de Rochefort. Uh, so very much in that tradition of uh, dialogue, which is song. So it's not the musical according to the canon of Hollywood and Vincent Minnelli and, uh, and uh, Alfred Astaire and, uh, and uh, Gene Kelly. It's not at all that. Where, uh, where in the American tradition, the film is separated from the dialogue, but uh, the musical number are helping uh, uh, give substance to the psychological uh, transformation of the character. Uh, so you have you have regular dialogue and like in Sing in the Rain, which is the the the, the most amazing film ever made, uh, and because it's also a, a comment on film history, and I'm sure you have seen it, or I hope you have seen it. If you have not seen it, go and see it because you cannot live without knowing Sing in the Rain. You know? And Chantal was not really a cinephile, but she had probably seen Sing in the Rain. But in any case, she had seen Jacques Demy. And she wanted to try that form, so she did in video, uh, you know, and she had written a song with somebody named Marc Herouet, and, uh, which is a musician from Brussels. So she had done that just before going on the shoot for Antenne 2 uh, of Pina Bausch, which was going to pay for uh, her finishing uh, that film, uh, Les années 80. So it's kind of interesting because there, 
She, les années 80 is a great film. Have you shown it already? Okay, so I don't have to explain it. I hope every one of you saw it because uh, uh, Chantal explained how people have to use their face to actually trigger some emotion on the part of the audience. So she gave a kind of lesson of direction and of film acting to dancers who are also uh, uh, not trained voice. And it's much better than the, in terms of musically than the film which follow, which I think is much better narratively, but in terms of music is not as good, which is the golden 80s. Because the Golden Eddies, which is a film I really adore, musically is really not good. You know, uh, the 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 songs are the same than the one you have seen in the années 80, but it's made it's sung by a professional singer, and not by the people they're all dub. And I think it's horrible. Literally, it's horrible. You know, and Chantal should have refused to do it, but you know. I was not around to tell her to be brave, I suppose. I don't know. <laughs> I will have refused. I will have said, fuck you. <laughs> okay, but now I'm going to explain what I think Golden Age is. It's still a wonderful film. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, in the in les années 80, the song where the narrative emotional core of the musical while changing confidence in dialogue suddenly erupt into song and then turn into movement and dance. The movement of the performer is about passing and crisscrossing paths that should merge but do not. There is no touching, no exchange, except in the dialogue and the song. The quest of the story is three women who work in a hair saloon in love with the same young man who work next door. In this musical centered on repressed emotion about unrequited love among the very young. It's in many ways something which is an elaboration of what she did in a different mode, episodic mode, in Toute une Nuit. Uh, and the people are young. In Toute une Nuit, you have old people, uh, uh, you have uh, people middle aged, and you have young people, but all the people who are really in the trance of not having the love life they desire are all the young people. In the golden 80s, you have the old and the young who are at stake. And for me, that's what makes it so interesting, you know, really so extraordinary. And also Delphine Serig, with somebody I greatly admire. Uh, and uh, I met, obviously, because of Chantal in the shooting of Jeanne Lillman. Uh, is there, uh, and she's the only one who sings with her real voice, which is really important, because she does not have a trained voice, but like Chantal, who does not have a trained voice, the voice has some, some uh, idiosyncratic quality, basically, so uh, there is a real person there, you know, it's not kind of uh, fake and... Uh, uh, um, the the American use that uh, that uh, expression, which now I have forgotten, uh, you know, it, they dub everything. Okay, so if you have a professional actor, he can dub himself naturalistically and realistically, but most people who are not professional cannot dub themselves convincingly. And the people who actually dub them, if that's happened, and sing for them don't necessarily have the same pitch of the voice. So you have somebody speaking a line in Golden Ladies and suddenly the singer who uh, erupts in song is has a slight difference in pitch and you know I'm not as good musically than Chantal was because she was remarkable but you you could hear that difference you know so it's a, it's a problem. But in Golden Ladies shot in 85 in 35, not in video, obviously. In addition to the principal motive of young love, Delphine Serig, who was memorable as Jeanne Dillman in a Kerman film from 75, reappeared in Golden 80s as Jeanne, the mother of the young man with the love interest among the young uh, uh, air, uh, people working in the air saloon next door. Now, the work of that uh, Galerie Marchande, La Galerie de la Coison, la Coison, de la Toison d'Or in Brussels. It's a gallery which exists. I don't know if you have gone to Brussels, but it's the gallery where Chantal's parents had a store all their life, since the late 50s. So when Chantal was nine years old in 58 or 59, when she was eight or nine, she was going to this gallery to the store of her parents. So she knew the the 
the background of the people, and that's beautifully represented, actually. Um, so, Jeanne uh, uh, in Golden Age is, is the mother of a young man. Uh, the story starts with the arrival of an American who recognized in, Jane, in Jeanne the young girl he rescued after he, liber he liberated the camp where she was incas incarcerated as a young girl at the end of the war 30 years ago. This other entanglement is particularly moving as the GI, played by Jean Berry, speak of how much he had loved her all those years and could never recoup for her running away from him one day. She never knew of his love and she left because she was worried to be a border to him. Comparing the two films, Les Vidéos Les Années 80 et Les Cine 83, in which the only protagonists are young and the 35mm film called The Nitty Shot in 85, in which long-term lost love is another added motif, the emotional impact is greater in the later film. While the staging of the movement and the dance is more original in the video, in terms of music, the video is also more daring as the voices are non-trained and full of life when in the feature film every actor are dubbed by professional singer for their song, except Delphine Serig who has a lovely song that she sings herself. To analyze the transformation of how music operates in a common film, another key date is 86, when she filmed a theater production with Delphine Serig and Coralie Serig in an adaptation of the correspondence of Sylvia Platt with her mother. The film led her home, which you are going to see. Huh? Yeah. Uh, I think it's a great, great film of Chantal Ackerman, although it's shot in video and it's very simple. Uh, uh, it's riveting because of the performance of the two actresses, but what is also make it riveting is the emotional charge of the text and the musical accompaniment by Sonia Vider at Tetten, who is by then was living with Chantal. Uh, they were partner in life, basically, and have stayed partner in life until uh, uh, for, for 30 years, 40 years. So, um, the production originated in New York in English and uh, I don't know how Delphine managed to want to do it uh, but it was done on stage in 83 in, in France in French translation and uh, uh, Chantal did a capture in video of that and it's three years later she did that staging uh, like if it was on a stage but on a studio set uh, of the piece and what made the film so interesting for me when I tried to see what, how music became totally key to whatever film Chantal made afterwards is because there is a cello, uh, Sonia is a concert cellist and there is, uh, and she's also somebody who, you know, there's not a repertory, an enormous repertory in, in cello. Uh, so cellists very often try to find way of decoding. Like I remember Pablo Casal. I mean, I knew a lot about that because when I was a kid, I was listening to a lot of cello. And uh, so Pablo Casal found things and he decoded, uh, you know, uh, for cello. And uh, and obviously, I was top of it, which was the teacher of uh, Sonia. Uh, who lived in the Soviet Union at the time. Uh, so she went there to study with him. Um, was uh, was also trying to find, to extend. Uh, so Sonia did all kind of very interesting uh, rediscovery and uh, Chantal often did film of what Sonia was actually playing. And those films, which I don't know if you have seen, they're not part of your of you, of you selection, but they are really interesting and they exist in DVD. Uh, and you must have them in your library. So if many of you are connected with the university, go and see them because if you like music, it's definitely interesting. And in general, it's not, you know, Chantal go, she, she was somebody who understood then to be as simple and as unshow off as possible was the best strategy to bring people to something they don't know. You, you understand what I mean? In other words, if you don't know a type of, 
of uh, classical music or music from the 19th century because you were raised only with the Beatles, you know, uh, just have the simpler uh, performance of that 19th century piece. And let's see if, you know, uh, if if the people who are listening to it are going to be convinced. And in general, they are, yeah. Um, because the, there is no pretense of being complicated. You know, it's not presented like if it was complicated. So for me, what is important in the relationship between Sonia and Chantal is the fact that they live together and a concert pianist has to practice five or six hours every day. So obviously she practiced in a sound proof room and Chantal did not have to be there all the time but you know if you live with somebody you want to know also what they do so she listened to her music so you you start to uh, uh, when you hear great music every day your mind is transformed and music change you abstraction become your norm I, I feel that in myself you know and I never discussed that with Chantal but I asked Sonia to read that to us to give me a comment if I if I was off the ball and I should not publish that, but she said, no, no, it's totally true. I feel that Chantal Ackerman was profoundly affected by this daily contact with live music in her quotidian and also a great musician uh, as well. So the quotidian being theatricalized is shown in the music film Ackerman shot with Sonia Vido Atherton in 89, Trois Stores sur le nom de sa chère, uh, written by André Dutilieu, uh, somebody, uh, you know, which was uh, Dutilleux, I, I forgot. Uh, I think he's a little bit older than Messiaen, but I'm not sure. Oh, he's the same generation. He's the 20th century in any case. At the request of Prenantianis of a Generation, Miss Laura Stopovich, 76, for the 70 years of Paul Sacher, great conductor, patron, and impresario commission, new work from Swavinsky, Bella Bartot, Elliot Carter to Paul Boulez. Uh, 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 Sonia Vidura Teton who studied with Rostopovich briefly performed the piece in 89 and Ackerman filmed in a theater staging that evoked a private apartment at night where the musician is playing for herself. You feel that the music is lived in the quotidian of the musician as well as her neighbor across the street who are reacting to what she plays because they hear it because the window it's in the summer and the window are open. Music penetrates all life around you. As the soloist cellist with the Warsaw Orchestra, Sonia Vida Atherton also edited a collage of music titled Alest, featuring music by Rachmaninoff, Doani Twitch, Nin, I don't pronounce properly, and with a Jewish traditional song. And that's really a great, uh, you know, record which I have, and I often listen to it. It's very interesting because it's it's what made the work of Pina Bash also compelling is the fact she used a uh, uh, popular song which often were old enough that people could not trace them but at the same time if they could trace them it was adding to their pleasure or, or uh, giving a, a narrative connotation to the gesture basically in the case of, of, uh, of Chantal what she when she filmed her girlfriend uh, playing a, a piece is the quality of the recording of the music and obviously the quality of the performance of Sonia as a cellist which counts so it's not at all uh, it's not a narrative film it's just uh, the capture of a performance if you want but at the same time he's staging the performance because it's not shown in a concert setting so it's reinventing the fact that music is in the daily life of somebody and I find that very important as a as what to represent, you know? Uh, how do you represent music? Why do we always think that classical mov m music has to be on a big stage with, uh, you know, a curtain and the curtain open and uh, there is a huge audience? No, it can be for an audience of one. Uh, great music is great music, basically. Um, so... I'm, I'm finishing my talk very quickly with speaking of La Captive at Demain au Déménage, which are two of the films I like the most with Foli Almayo, but I had not seen the film when I wrote that piece. Uh, so, uh, obviously, 
in narrative film uh, and in particular in La Captive, the use of music is fundamental. You have already seen La Captive, yeah. So you have the Bachmanina of Lille des Morts, which start and finish the film, and uh, I'm not going to elaborate. There is the things which is the most interesting and linked to what Chantal learned in the difference between the 1980, the video she made of those songs she had written, uh, with Mark Herouet, uh and the Golden Lady when it's uh, when it's trained voice, so she had that kind of duet across the street between a trained voice, and uh, it's Cosi from today, I think. Uh, I forgot if it's Cosi from today. I must have the reference here, but I forgot. Uh, uh, you know when uh, when. Uh, 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 um, Sylvie Testud, who played the uh, captive, who played uh, uh, Ariane, uh, is singing a non-trained voice, and she sings in concert with somebody. It's a Mozart opera, where there's a dialogue between two voices. So you have two voices of their very different caliber, and that's really extraordinary <laughs> to hear. Uh, musically, it's interesting to hear. Um, now, what I think, and the, uh, uh, Ariane also sing a song, which is a song from Belgium, I think, Walking in the Forest of Chaville, uh, because if on today, uh, the Aria, I already spoke about it. But the fact then, the taste of the music of Rakhavinov is the one of Simon, the man, and uh, uh, Mozart and uh, the, the Contine, which is a children's song, uh, Walking in the Bois de Chaville, uh, is actually the woman. So there is a gender difference in the taste of music, which I think is totally Chantal from the 70s. You know, we were so concerned about making differences between uh, woman and man sensibility. Yeah. So it's coming back in a film which was shot in 1999 and released in 2000. And obviously, it's very important, sexual politics is very important because that story is, you know, coming from Marcel Proust, La Prisonnière, and uh, In Search of Thing Past, or uh, À la Recherche du Temps Perdu, in French, and uh, Remembrance of Thing Past. Uh, and in many ways, if there is a writer which confronted his sexuality in his work uh, uh, is Marcel Proust. And if there is a filmmaker who did the same thing in a film, it's definitely Chantal Agama. So they have a lot in common, although they, they are 100 years apart, literally. Uh, or, I mean, not quite, but uh, 80 years apart, yeah. In, the, in La Captive, it was done in 2000, and uh, the book was written in 22, and uh, Marcel was dead by 24, 25, 1925. So, Demain au Déménage uh, 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 is really wonderful. It starts, I remember Chantal, when she explained to me she was going to do that film, and she told me, you know, I do the film because I want to see a piano being suspended by, <laughs> by a girl and moving into an apartment, which is exactly the first image of the film. If you have seen the film, they have seen the film already? We haven't screened it. Oh, no, so I'm not going to tell you anything. But it's wonderful because it's very much about music, so I'm not going to describe it because I'm sure my time is extended and we want to see uh, Chantal and Jopina demander. But uh, to conclude, I think... She never used music in her film exactly the same way from one film to the next. And she never used it Hollywood style. She never used it to repeat something which you already knew to the dialogue or to the narrative situation. Music was always primarily used as a counterpoint in opposition with something. Uh, I'm not sure it's, there is no example uh, but it's certainly even the case for Cash in New York, which is the other musical comedy uh, or, or screwball comedy of uh, 95. So uh, y you have learned already that Ackerman was very interested in, uh, in, 
in evoking different film genres. And film genre is totally commercial Hollywood. You know, finding uh, uh, a system to, uh, to be able to assess uh, film production uh, uh, possibility in terms of uh, making money and so on and so on. So uh, I find that very interesting because she used that in a way which had nothing to do with maximizing uh, the possibility to be more popular in her film. She used it to uh, do something she had not done before, literally. Yeah. Therefore, as an experimentalist, I'm going to conclude on that. Yeah. Okay, so thank you for your attention. And, uh, Well, first I would like to thank you for setting up this film so beautifully. Um, one passage that stood out for me in your talk was the one where you talked about uh, the films that Chantal Ackermann made with and about the music of Sonia Vider Atutlon, mm -hmm. and where, where you stressed that uh, you can make a perfect film without telling a story, obviously, but uh, that these films are really about the performance and about the music and that in a way they're complete films in themselves because they capture that performance. And this film opens with Chantal Ackermann sort of stating her slight dissatisfaction with the result where she says, you know, we followed her around. Uh, it becomes clear in in the, the scene at the end uh, where she talks about what Pino Bausch means to her or how she responded to it, that this was a, a very intense, meaningful encounter with an artist for her, but she's still slightly dissatisfied. Do you want me to give you why? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for me, the film is also pretty horrible because it's so much about the abuse you know, the mise-en-scene of the abuse of men abusing women. So it's very difficult for a woman. Chantal has never been abused or molested as a child, okay? But not that I know of. And she had had relationship with men and women, but more importantly with women. But, but uh, why to do work like that, you know? And... and uh, Myself, I was totally amazed. I, I, I could distance myself because in many ways I see it more as theater and not as a social statement. But when it's seen in an excerpt and you don't see the totality of the work, you, and, and the choice of Chantal was obviously what she was confronting, which is something which is about the violence in sexuality, which is not something she has really known. And she has described, at least she has not described it in her film. She has described all kind of situation in which what is, what is complicated is the relationship you have with family member and actually relationship which do not have a sexual component in them. Uh, but here it's all about sex and it's not about the pleasure of sex, but the misery of it and, uh, you know, the fact that one is always exploited by the other. So I think it's unbearable, basically. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> and and um, what is actually I think when you saw the totality of the piece which we could not really film it was done for television so although I shot some long shots they were not used and uh, and we had to shoot things we did not have that much time in the Palais des Pâques because it's a union we could not be always there and uh, so we could not uh, record some of the important rehearsal we recorded with no light, so it's badly, uh, you know. But the, the, the Dominique Merci, which was the, was the great star of the company, the one which is, who could dance uh, ballet and also dance modern dance, and has a very expressive, and also he spoke French, so we, we spoke a lot with him. What was so interesting in the, in the conflict that Chantal had with the world of Pina is the fact that she was functioning as, a, I'm going to use a French term, uh, une sorte d'analyse sauvage, psychanalyse sauvage. And it's something we had known together, actually, in an aborted film which was never made in 73, which had to do with the psychoanalyst. 
And uh, a group of women who wanted to make a film would never end up to be made. And, uh, you know, they were the kind of women who say, but you are going to rent a, 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 a camera from a man. But I say, but the only company who... We, we all camera man. It's nothing I can do. I cannot manufacture a camera. The woman, you are crazy. In any case, uh, the, the 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 utilization, the 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 nice element here is the fact there is an, uh, a way of showing how Pina used the inner self and emotion of. Uh, the guy who is coming back from America, uh, the man I love. And he was singing it, and it's so wonderful when he sings it because he does not sing it really. You just have the music behind it, yeah. And when suddenly it's staged in the, and Chantal was not stupid to be, she was really doing it intentionally. When he did it for us, he was so charming, so tender. And when he did it on stage, it suddenly become aggressive and cynical. And you know, so there's a transformation of the material which make it more cynical when it's under the lighting of the theater. And it's the same for Contact Off and what I describe in my uh, text because, uh, you know, that, that scene, I still remember shooting it, you know, and it was really unbearable to watch, yeah. What irritated me about the staged version of the of the sign language scene is that the audience laughs yes. at the performance yes. and laughs at, exactly. the, at the sign that's language, what and happened. that's very irritating. But it's also the same thing for Dominique when he does these kind of amazing things. I mean, that's what Pina wanted to do, you know. Uh, it, 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 somebody was not reflected like a... Uh, a film spectator reflect on what made people laugh and feel good about their laugh, like in the Marx Brothers yeah. or in certain comedy with whatever, Bill, uh, Judy Holiday or whatever. The, the, the classical Hollywood had the sense of giving the possibility to do a laugh, which was not against yes. the performer. And it's something which basically is not that much practice anymore. The, the world has been, been more... Uh, cynical and in 83 was not yet but you you see a certain tendency which has aggravated yeah yeah and for me that's a big issue you know i want to make film which does not aggress the spectator which actually show them things maybe they don't know and which are complicated or whatever but i'm not going to put my own idea uh, in the foreground, you know, and it's what Pina always does. She right. put, she's never seen. Did you notice? Yeah, only only in the end. At yes. the, no, at the beginning, yeah. she gives the gesture yeah. at the beginning, which is a very interesting and alluring gesture, yeah. and uh, of you know uh, uh, the woman uh, and the man actually yeah. bombing their breast and saying me 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 basically. Yeah. So it's all about me. Yeah. <laughs> And Chantal is never about her. Right, you know, it's right. never about me, me, me. So I understand why she she was extremely uh, troubled by it. Uh, troubled by it. But, but then again, you could still say, I mean, the, the, the film is honest in the sense that yeah. she puts in the film what irritated her most. Yeah, but also what is the best of Pina Bausch. In other words, it's it's aggressive, but at the same time, you know, I don't know. It's it's very American that coarseness in, uh, and it's maybe it's also very German. I had no idea. I see it as German because the word of Pinamash is really German, you know. And she, no, and no. Uh, I hope I'm right. Uh, I don't want to bad mouth uh, because I also have a certain uh, respect for her uh, ingenuity and also her uh, diversity and, and I thought Contact Off and uh, you know Café I mean I thought all the pieces we saw uh, were very different and very uh, interesting to see you yeah. know uh, so I felt in the course of 77 to 83 which is six years it's an enormous amount of work, which is very diverse, yeah. So for me, it's a, a great, great period, really. And Nelken is so different from the rest, too, because yeah, the, there, there is no more sexual uh, differentiation. Everybody is dressed the same way, you know. 
men and women, they do the same thing. There is really something which is the opposite. So she kind of realized, you know, and Chantal showed that in a way because of the editing and the way she, she, uh, she, uh, she finished the film with the worst of Pina manipulation yeah. after she testified the fact that she was seduced by Bernalion, but who cannot be seduced by her? You know, Carlos Garda and Tego, nobody, you know, it's like, I hear them in my dream, you know, call of you, I bet, because it's beautiful music ever, you know, uh, uh, in terms of music you can dance on, yeah, so. Do we have uh, questions sure. from the audience on the film or on the talk? Yes, please. Um, one second, please. Wait for the microphone so that everyone can hear you. Thank you very much for all your work. Um, it seems that some of the characteristics in uh, Pina Bausch's work, it's a, a lot of repetition and a lot of gesture and a lot of brutality. And I was wondering in the image, um, in the framing of the images, are is it intentional to draw upon this exaggeration? Do you, was that a conscious thing or did, was that something that just... What do you mean just... the exaggeration? I mean, the gestures were totally decided by Pina yeah. and they were made by a, a company. So we did not direct anything. Okay. We just selected. And we mostly worked for television at the time. We shot in 16 millimeters, so we shot in film, not in video. Uh, uh, in 83, you know. Uh, it will have been better SP, which I used in 85 to shoot a film that I showed earlier today. Uh, a dance film, and uh, in which I have long shot and everything. But in many ways, Chantal decided, and I shot longer shot. But the most interesting and the most in use is actually not the shot coming from Milan or from La Felice or from the different theater we were in, but it's actually the practice we shot in Essen with lights and the side light and light which are movie light in other words because they are not coming from the wing or from the top like in a grid in a, in a theater so those are the one against the black background where there is the the working of just one couple when we know in the actual play there will be uh, 10 of those because she had a large company yeah so uh, it is there then you see those gestures which are exaggerated, but that's Pina's design. It's not Chantal Ackermann's design, you know? Uh, so uh, the, the movement, for the people who are expert of Pina's uh, work, uh, until uh, at least 10 years after that film was made, or even 20 years after that film was made, I know plenty of people in theater, they told me it was the best film ever made on her, and we explained the most about her, you know? And certainly it's much better than the film who came after her that too, because I detest the Wim Vendors, which, you know, is horrible. And besides, I, I despise that filmmaker in any case, you know, he's pretentious. Uh, but, <laughs> you probably saw me. I don't see why I insult one of your filmmakers. I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> so I should not do that. But you see what I mean? The... The, 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 what, uh, something you guess, but it's not actually, it's not verbalized by Chantal because that will have been really, uh, that will have been not honest. It's what Vincent is saying, you know, she, she's honestly showing what distresses her, but on the other hand, she's also do not misrepresent Pina Bausch. She represents Pina Bausch fairly because there is moment also of tenderness in. Uh, uh, in uh, in the in the in the t the rehearsal of gesture, uh, which happen in Essen, which come and go and actually are interspersed with elements from actually fragment of performance, which are listed with the name of the performance and later on at the end of the film, you know which date, so you can put them together. Yeah. But uh, Come Dance With Me is the first one, and there's only man and one woman. Uh, and uh, uh, in, uh, in Contact Off, there is the same number of men and women. You did not see that, but uh, it's, it's, it's pair, you know. Eight is also pairs. Sometimes pair of two men and two women, too, because it's in a park and there's all kind of uh, 
uh, there is also a difference in terms of clothing and uh, or have nudity and so on. It's set in the summer, I think. So those things are not necessarily visible in what you have seen, but the 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 big breakthrough with Nelken, and I've not seen production of her until she came to the U.S. and she came to the U.S. three years later, and I could not be there because I think I was shooting a movie somewhere else. So I uh, no, I was not shooting a movie. I was very sick in an hospital having surgery. So uh, I could not see her when she came to New York the first time, and uh, and uh, I saw her only. Uh, in the 90s in New York, yeah. But she started a career by doing, you know, interpretation of Greg uh, Norridis, then she redid later, and also uh, Stravinsky, right of the spring, you know. So she did not work only with popular dance, it just <coughs> happened then that tour she did, which coincide with the shoot of the movie, had something similar in the kind of music use and the uh, and how the music interact with the with the charge uh, uh, gender specific behavior of uh, uh, semi aggression in or, or uh, seduction in which the seduction is uh, is uh, def or the need of the woman who is not addressed like come dance with me she would never dance with the man in the white suit you know yeah we have another question, please. Yeah, um, I really enjoyed to see Chantal talking. That is so cool to put that on. But I have to ask you, because you're there in the end, the editing, how was then the dialogue? So something, for example, that uh, Pina was not said... Well, she did the editing. So I, I, uh, I, I saw the rushes, I think, once, and I went back to New York. I had another film to do. And Pina, so, oh, she never said, for example, don't show something. No, no, you know? the interview was constantly delayed. And uh, the last day, she was cornered, and she mm -hmm. did not say more. Yeah, it's well. not, she, she definitely did not want to answer. And that was also one of the reasons. Yeah, it's very disappointing. Chantal felt offended. You yeah, know. it was kind yeah. of weird. But then, um, as now, you talk, I yeah. don't really understand why, because the question is very banal. And uh, what is your future? You know, she obviously had a project she was working on. There is no somebody with a company. They have to raise money. They have to. They have a board, yeah, yeah. which asks them what they are going to do next year. And obviously, you don't get to the to the Scala in Milan until it's decided two years before, you know. Therefore, she already knew in which theater she will be the following year. And she already knew which piece she will put in. So the fact she did not even say that, you know. Yeah. What uh, is she uh, so it's kind of interesting because she did not want to be advertising work which is not done yet that i understand but she could have found an answer which was a little bit generous and not saying anything right. except strength which what does he mean you know <laughs> but because the evening is also yours i want to know uh, a little bit about uh, um the your relation with the, the whole thing with the aesthetic of nature because for example on your film the sky on location and also what we saw this afternoon and his relation with nature can you talk a little bit why you have a, such a sort of a good uh, of nature? i have a relation with nature because i had a grandmother who was a farmer which had no money uh, one acre of land and therefore work for other people who had more land and was and and became a widow relatively young, and therefore needed man to help her. So basically, I met my grandmother who was living in Alsace, uh, way after the end of the war. I'm born during World War Two, and uh, I met her. I was already nine or ten years old, but she showed me the color of the sky and told me it was going to rain the next day. And, you know, show me a garden and apologize because she was using a little bit of a place to do flower, but she thought flower were important for her, you know, so it totally, totally changed my life, <laughs> you know. My mother was not a gardener, my father was, so 
we lived in very small town, but we had a little garden. And my father, obviously, during the war and after the war, was growing vegetables, so we could eat, you know. So uh, in many ways, uh, garden and uh, and tilling the land have been in it's my DNA. At, actually, on my father's side, my mother was coming from a city background and very different. Yeah. So I had the best of both worlds because my mother brought me to the museum when I was a kid, and I saw plenty of painting and plenty of theater. So. You know, I know theater, so when I see Pina Bausch, I understand theater. I cannot be shocked like Chantal was. She had no reading of, th of how theatrical it was. And the, the, the theater stage with its distance, you know, uh, do, d d diminished the violence, in a way. I think I felt that, yeah. Because I had photographed a lot of theater, and uh, besides, I'm more an intellectual, you know, so I think... Uh, I, I rationalized my, I rationalized my reaction by trying to find a defense, and you know, I, I was raised with two brothers who victimized me when I was a kid. I was the youngest, so I'm I'm tough. <laughs> See what I mean? Chantal was not tough; she was the oldest, and there was another girl, her sister. I had two sisters. Yes, they were before you, and you were the little kid. Oh my God. Yeah, that's it. He was victimized by his sisters. <laughs> yes, yes. Please, one more question. Yes, I found interesting what you said in the talk and also in the movie that there is an opposition, you said, between uh, what the music uh, yes. uh, plays and what uh, we see. You, you, you felt it was true. Uh, yeah, the yes, music yes, in it, general. it was here. You, you could hear this German song where the men always sing, I'm not able uh, to look in your eyes. But then in the gestures before, yeah, you don't, could say I that could there is... I could not understand what the song was saying, actually. Yeah, yeah. So you tell me... Uh, yes, they also uh, they say always, um, I'm not able uh, to look um, in your eyes. But what you see in the violent gestures before uh, is um, um, that they so try to rape it. To rape the woman oh, it's in the a very artificial, touch on their body the very artificial and, uh, way. They always touch yeah. the same thing, so it's not yeah. really. But you really feel it's the it's it's a variation on a possible rape. Yeah, it's actually what is alluded to. Yeah, for me it was very clear when I saw it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And so the song is in. I know the song is in German, and the song because it's contact off. I I I kind of. Uh, uh, it's it's a song from the thirties. Is that it? I cannot look in your eyes. That's what. Yeah, you bet. You cannot look in the eyes of uh, your aggressor. That's for sure. Yeah. So it's it's not. But it's actually a mellow song in term musically, and uh, it's not a, a violent song in terms of beat or anything. So in term musically, if you don't understand the lyric you feel it's totally in contradiction and uh, it's adding to the discomfort, I think. But in that sense, it, that probably also appealed to, to Chantal, that contrast. But not if it's a rape, you know. You cannot endorse abuse to a woman if you like women or if you're a feminist and you want to... You know, in 83, feminism was out of style, you know, that's very true. I mean, uh, that's the reason I went to landscape, you know. Who cares about anything else, you know. You had to, uh, when I started to do my film on landscape, Reagan was uh, just candidate to the president. But having him, it's like having Trump now, you know. It's about the same. He kind of destroyed so many things. Uh, made the Supreme Court uh, totally uh, against Roe versus Wade and uh, pro uh, Abortion, you know, so that's really a, a big issue uh, until today. So it totally changed the political landscape for the worse. So uh, in many ways in, in America, there was a big change. Uh, in France, it was not such a change because uh, it was not as bad because the 80, when, when do you have Mitterrand coming in? 82? Uh, 80, 81. 81, he comes yeah. in so 81 and... Mitterrand was better than, uh, 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 you know, the guy before, like Giscard d'Estaing. Yeah. Yeah.
Um, but binary is uh, a middle name for Pina Bausch work at that time. And to German, that was like... It's a, not no, Chantal. It's the <laughs> same question, you know. She did, the gesture are her and the tempo and the music accompaniment, all of that mm. is the work of Pina Bausch. Yeah. Chantal does not it, it, change everything. Yeah, yeah, but Chantal anything. probably have a hard time to... She just to decide to keep certain scenes way longer than others. I understand so why that's she... the privilege of the filmmaker. You can emphasize certain things and diminish others by duration. Yeah, but I understand why Chantal said that I could even look at some of the works, no? Because for her, probably yeah. it was too much. No, as a lesbian and as a... Uh, But um, I'm not even feminist. sure. I, uh, at the time, I did not realize how Chantal was made uncomfortable. I learned it in the course of the film, yeah. But we, had, we shot a lot more than what is used, obviously, because it's uh, 50, uh, 57 or 56 minutes, which is the... The, for this for this kind of documentary is the rule. I mean, there was there was very few uh, 90 minutes documentary. Now the Arte did some, but on Tinder we never have done that. So the limit was uh, uh, we didn't that did not prevent us to shoot because you know when you shoot a documentary you always overshoot because you don't know exactly how you're going to structure the material and you don't know what you are going to be able to shoot the next day. You know. Maybe nothing interesting, or maybe something absolutely fantastic. So you keep on shooting no matter what every day, even if nothing really great happened. That's what documentary demand, if you want. So uh, the editing, I was not part of it, but I think now that I can analyze it a little bit, because I've seen the film more than once and, uh, and so on. And now there's a DVD in the US, of the, so I have that DVD too, because I want to rewrite my text, and the other thing was still uh, not. I find this film so important today because these two points, Pina and Ackerman, and the situation that was created to make this film, and what I like so much is the the art, you know, like the making of art being art in this case of this film. Because you see then yeah. this different of uh, the whole... Definitely. No, I saw Pina live Bush, some I don't of this. I think an artist. She's a theater person. Uh, she makes theater piece for me. I saw live. I saw this piece live. But live. not really movement. That's the reason she, for me, it goes dance theater. The dance is not really part of it. It's gesture which actually connect with characters and theater. And use some speech too, but the, 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 the theater aspect of it is not uh, a regular play. You know, the drama is really between the set and the gesture, basically. So that's very interesting because gestures are very important in the cinema of Chantal Ackerman. So it's true that the subject was a perfect fit with Chantal. Mm. Yeah. Because so many of uh, what is great in Jeanne Dillman is the gesture of Delphine Serig, right. which is gesture which were rehearsed every morning with a video camera with Chantal. I was setting up the camera for her and I was, you know, changing my light. Uh, Because the, the crew arrived at noon, or uh, 10 minutes to noon, we were starting at noon. And from 9 to uh, 11.30, Chantal was working with Delphine, and Delphine was going to make up 11.30 to 12, and was ready to shoot at 12. So I could, I could uh, you know, with a relatively small crew, an inexperienced crew, uh, Uh, I could manage uh, a pretty sophisticated light because I had time to prepare on the, for every setup, uh, which had been rehearsed in the morning for the afternoon shoot. So you realize that Chantal Ackerman film are made with gesture more than anything else. Mm. You know, that's what I think, at least. Huh? That, yeah. yeah. That's a wonderful concluding statement. Okay. Because it gives Thank us, you very much. It also gives us a key to uh, the next films we're going to, to see Which is and what? watch. The, <laughs> the next lecture. Yes. <laughs> We have uh, Sonia Campanini here. She's going to be talking about La Chambre and Hotel Monterey. Exactly. Um, La Chambre, oh, there's, there's two female shots. Huh? Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> and a last question about uh, your collaboration. We can we can co continue the conversation in the foyer uh, in front of yeah. the museum. Unfortunately, in front of the cinema, but we have. Uh, I, I wrote a little bit about uh, in uh, Chantal at the retrospective at the Centre Georges Pompidou in 2003 or four, 
And uh, there's a catalogue of that, uh, yeah. And I wrote a text which is linking La Chambre, uh, Telmontré, and, uh, and Jeanne Dillman, actually. Yeah. And we had a debate, because Chantal did not want to be uh, owning anything to Michael Snow. She was pissed about that. <laughs> so, you know, she told me La Chambre was shot after Telmontré, but don't believe her. I retracted myself because I wanted to please her, but it's totally, totally untrue. I shot La Chambre in February, and you know why? As a camera person, I know the sun could not be so low to enter inside a room in June. You know, no way. So for me, I'm giving you the, you see it next week. <laughs> you understand what I mean? Just look at where the sun is getting yeah. from, and it has to be winter, you know? <laughs> okay. Thank you and so Hotel much. Hotel Montreux was made uh, in, uh, in May, and we started at five in the afternoon and finished at dawn the next day. So it was really important to do that, you know. So whatever we were shooting, we shot during that period, yeah. And Chantal had lived in the hotel, so she knew the people, she, and she has permission, yeah. For them to keep the door open so we could shoot them in their room or, you know. Uh, so everything was uh, came from her being an habitant of the hotel, basically taking the elevator in particular. <laughs> so you can see uh, more about that on the 9th of May with a lecture by Sonia Campanini. So and don't forget tomorrow we're screening the film Die Klage der Kaiserin. The um, yeah, that, that we like to see, but yeah. I'm in a plane going back to. California, so no way. It's going to be interesting to see Pina Bausch. And thank you very much, Babette Mangold, for being with us. Thank you, Vincent.